Hello. Wasn't that a long song? This is Business Plus with Lisa and this is Lisa talking. It is Sunday morning in Perth, Western Australia. Uh, And if you're somewhere else in the world, it's probably evening. So thank you so much for joining me and my guest today. It's fantastic to have you here. I've had the opportunity to have a real warm up this morning because I was co-host with the amazing Michael Daisley for the last couple of hours because Kyle is off jet setting around Uh, and that was a real pleasure and he always makes me giggle but uh, there's a lot more responsibility when you're actually in the uh, host seat so I appreciate you Michael and uh, thank you for a fabulous morning. But let me invite you to um, invite you. (laughs) Let me um, introduce you to the amazing guests that I have here this morning. I'm joined by Kim and Luke Herman, uh, husband and wife team. And I'm also here with Paul Harmon. How well did I do getting Herman and Harmon? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know whether you guys actually had already picked up on that, but when I was um, getting everything together, I thought that was not even deliberate. And like, there's, I don't even know whether there's one or two letters in it. So uh, let's have ladies first. Um, Kim, tell us a little bit about yourself. Maybe start by. Let's start with a really easy one. Uh, where where were you born? Uh, tell us about your family. Hi, thank you, Lisa. Um, so, yes, my name's Kim Herman. I was born in, in New South Wales, actually, and lived my, the first eight years of my life there. I have my parents and a, a younger brother. And then my dad decided it was a good idea that he wanted to live his dream and join the SAS. Wow. And we were uplifted and moved to Perth. So I do kind of class Perth as my real home. I've lived majority of my life here. So So how old were you when you came here? Eight. Eight. So that was a very pivotal time in your life, I would imagine. It was a pivotal time. And for me, I was very close with my grandparents, my dad's mum and dad. And we spent a lot of our weekends with my grandparents. So when we moved here, that was kind of all taken away. And, um, you know, we moved, stayed and started at new schools and, you know, you were the new kid on the block. And, yeah, it was a big, big event. (laughs) I have to ask you, what was it like having a dad that was in the SAS? Um, Like, is it – and please don't share if you don't feel comfortable (laughs) doing so, but I've got these images of being woken up in the morning having to do (laughs) push-ups and – Not so much that. He, he was a very he was very strict, um, so we had a very strict upbringing. Um, it was a great tool to have to get rid of boys that you didn't really want interested <laughs> in you. You were a bit scared of my. So dad. you've been looking at the positives <laughs> for a long time, Kim. So there was positives in having him, and you know there was a lot of time where he was actually away. Um, so I guess during a lot of my childhood, he he would be away working. Yeah. And um, Luke, great to have you here as well. I'm using a freestanding microphone today and I'm just trying to get used to it. So if I'm not looking at you directly, that's the reason why. Yeah, that's fine, Lisa. <laughs> so uh, you and Kim have been married for a lot of years. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Yeah. And were you born in WA as well? Yeah, I was, I was born in WA in Subiaco Hospital and then uh, went to Carrot Primary School. So northern suburbs has been uh, my bread and butter where I've sort of been around. Yeah, and um, what age did you guys meet? Uh, I think we're like 24. 24. Yeah, yep. 24. 24. Oh, lovely. We've been married coming up 20 years and we've been together 26 years. Yeah. Well, that's quite an achievement these days. Yeah. So that's our, uh, that's our Hermans and um, I'm really looking forward to them both sharing how they've been able to grow through their personal development together and, um, you know, some really, really um, good takeaways for anyone listening from a mental health sphere. Um, and Paul, thank you so much for joining us today as well. Um, I've got a feeling by your accent that you were not born in um, not only WA but possibly not Australia. That's correct. The Emerald Oil. Yes, I was born in Dublin. In Dublin, Dublin. Yes. yes. And uh, tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Um, single mum, four siblings, and I think um, a wonderful childhood. In Ireland, uh, we, we say it would be a great little country if you could only put a roof on it. 
it rains all the time. But oh. um, you know, the same. Just I think the upbringing was it's eight o'clock in the morning, school holidays, get out and don't come back till it's dinner time. So yeah. growing up in um, a, a council estate, you get the advantages of growing up with all the other children. So you just go out, have a lot of fun, come back when it's dinner time when you're hungry. Is it still like that over there now? Um. The reason yeah. I ask is yep. because that was pretty much my upbringing in good old Gosnells, Perth, Western Australia, uh, and that was the era in the 70s, so I wondered whether kids might still get that opportunity to be brought up like that today. Absolutely. I, I, I went back um, about five years ago, and it was, it was you still see the same obviously kids out playing tip to can same things, same games on the street. Um, you know, you, it's... You come, you get brought up in a, a council estate where it's got lots of good advantages. You were safe, lots of good kids, and um, you spent most of your summer nights staying out till eight or nine at night on the street playing games. And how old were you when you came here? Uh, I was twenty five. Um, a friend of mine uh, moved to Perth, lived in Fremantle, and gave me a call and said, "Look, you got to come at least for six months and check it out." And that's all I planned to come for. I planned to come for six months. And um, came, it was the first time I ever drank coffee. Really? Yes. I Why love. is that? Do they not have coffee in drinkers. Dublin? <laughs> no, we're tea. We, we've grown up. <laughs> when, you, when you're a child. <laughs> Things you, you learn. Uh, you know, um, we, we, we drank tea as kids. You know, yes. Think about, thinking back on it now, like, it's like, never let my kids drink tea. But <laughs> we grew up on, on tea, tea and biscuits. And that was the, um, the environment that never drank coffee. And, uh, um, yeah, my Irish friend said, you have to come to this place called the Dome. So I went to the Dome. The Dome Cafe, the Dome coffee Cafe shop. <laughs> yeah. Fremantle. Yep. And he yep. gave me a cold coffee. It was called an iced coffee. <laughs> it was and called I, an iced coffee. And I thought to myself, these guys are crazy. <laughs> oh, this is hilarious. <laughs> this, this is, what, what's going on? People <laughs> drinking cold coffee. And then, um, Bunch of weirdos in Australia. <laughs> and I, and I, had, I had my first iced coffee and then I tried a mocha. And then, um, a see, la- I don't a get latte. the whole mocha thing. But then I became addicted. <laughs> that was it. I was done. <laughs> so, um, fourteen years later, I'm, I, I probably would drink six coffees a day, easy. Okay, so um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there is our confession. Yeah. I have to ask you, going back to a couple of minutes ago, you said you used to play, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you said tip tea can. Tip. They can. <laughs> so you had the street lamp, like, you know, on the street. And that was the thing. One one child would hug the street lamp and count to 30. Yeah. And all the kids would go and hide. And that person who was um, counting had to go find the children. But the game was to get to the can before you were seen, which was the lamppost. So if you could touch, tip, tip that can, you were home safe. Do your kids play that now? Unfortunately, one thing I really struggle with is that there's not really a, a body of that social community unless you're actually going out um, for play dates. Uh, I find that on the street that we live, there's there's no kids that play. Or so if you if you want to have a, a catch up and let your kids play, it's it's down the park. And the wonderful thing about this country is that the how they invest in the in the playgrounds. Um, and everything that they do for, for to allow kids to have a great time. So, no, unfortunately, um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think my kids have ever played tip to can. <laughs> I, have to, I, ha- I do have to ask Luke and Kim because I'm very um, interested. I'm curious. Have you Had you ever heard of that game? I hadn't. I think I do remember playing similar sort of game, but I can't remember Spot, what we uh, call it. I remember it. it's like similar spotlight because it gets darker here earlier. So I can remember playing Spotlight when we used to go um, away on family holidays. That was good fun. So uh, you've just t- uh, taught the um, listeners something that they had not he- heard before, a tip to can. Yes, and some parental advice, send the kids out at eight and nine. <laughs> Don't let them come back till <laughs> five or six. <laughs> it was where kids should be anyway, yeah. out exploring and playing. Right. So when we come back, I'm going to ask each of you to share um, what you would like to talk about today, what um, is not okay and what you're uh, working on individually to... Um, make it okay but in the meantime we are going to play a song so let's listen to that's just how i feel with noah and we are back that song just stopped halfway through that's just how i feel with noah dylan must be having a lazy sunday morning 
Uh, you're on IPL Radio, uh, Inspiring Passionate Lives, a radio station that's all around mental health and it's Sunday morning in Perth, Western Australia uh, and it's so good to have you listening today. I'm joined in the studio by um, a few guests this morning but I'm going to talk to Kim Herman and her husband Luke uh, um, about what's not okay so, Kim, when I asked you what you're most passionate about and what is not okay, you said people and families out there are emotionally struggling because they think that it's just the way it is. And you went on to say your whole life can change when you say yes and you put yes in capital letters to taking the journey of healing and loving yourself that you are the co-creator of your life and when we have the courage to do the inner work, break the generational cycles, it not only changes our life, it has a ripple effect of 75,000 people. Now that just totally (laughs) blew me away because I'm a big believer of the ripple effect and I really do get that like if I do one good thing I just love being able to know and see the benefit it has that ripple effect of so many other people but I would love to find out um, how that does affect 75,000 people but maybe um, if you start by sharing with others how you came to be on this journey I just wanted to add that blew my mind when I learned about that extent of the ripple effect as well. Like it is mind blowing, but it is absolutely. I mean, that's like that's more people than in some country towns, isn't it? Well, yeah. How did I get on this journey? Look, really, um, I I didn't have an awful childhood. Um, I, you know, I had a a parents that loved me, but I was brought up in in a family which wasn't overly nurturing. And I think that my particular being and soul really longed for that. But I was very, very independent. I was very um, determined young woman. I moved out of home very young and I just got on with life. And I never really dealt with any of the emotions that came up in my childhood. Like I mentioned earlier about moving into state, leaving very nurturing grandparents behind. Um, I just got on with it. I didn't really address. That's the way that we were often brought often up, brought wasn't up. And it? And it's the way our parents were yep. brought up. So, yep. you know, I certainly don't blame my parents at all. And, you know, um, you know, I had a few times in, you know, a few awful, stressful, traumatic things happened during, you know, teenage years. Again, just pushed it down, got on with life. And I married the first man that showed me some love and attention and realised about eight months into the relationship that I, as much as I loved this person, it was more like a brother than a a partner and um, found the courage to leave that and then met this wonderful man. And then when we had children, so I was very much in control of my life. Or you thought you were. I thought I was. <laughs> I micromanaged everything and I was a bit of like I was a control freak. I'm relating time, to a lot of what you say. I was. Yeah. And anyone that has babies and children realizes that you're not so much in control <laughs> anymore. <laughs> and for me that it, it like it, it opened the floodgates of all these emotions that I had suppressed to come up. And f- I became anxious, overwhelmed, um really not struggling, really not coping with day-to-day life and it presented as anger for me. When I got overwhelmed, I would explode like a volcano. And unfortunately and it was Luke. Luke is nodding. <laughs> Luke and the kids that copped yeah. the brunt of it. Yeah. So you remember those times, Luke? Yeah, I do, yeah. 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 Did you feel helpless? You do, yeah, because it's, um, you know, it's the wife and, and mother of your kids and, you know, and you want everyone to get along, you know, because for me, I was a bit of a people pleaser as well. So for that was like, you know, I was always going into that place where I was trying to fix things. As a guy, you always want to fix things. And it's like, you know, when you when your partner's lost control and goes angry and that is like, what do I need to do to fix it? So as a guy, but I realised that wasn't my problem. 
at the time, but it took me a while before we realised yeah. that. And then, of course, you were on your own journey, and we'll come back to you in a moment. Mm. So, um, Kim? And I think anger was my go-to emotion because my dad was a very angry person. And that's – he was either, you know, happy or angry. There was no in-between. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I just went on a downward spiral of really self-loathing and hating myself. I hid it very well from the external world. I still came across as a very confident person. Um, and – It really was seeing the damage I was doing to my kids. Like I remember one day my son spilt his glass of milk at the breakfast table and I (coughs) exploded like a volcano. The way I spoke to my kids, if I saw someone else do that, I would have been mortified. It was like this little switch would flick and it was out of control. And then I would go into shame and guilt about my behaviour and it was like this vicious cycle. I started isolating myself from my friends because I was terrified that they would find out that side of me and then they wouldn't want to be my friends. And, yeah, this particular day, just seeing these two little pairs of eyes looking at me and they were scared of their mum. And I remember falling to the floor and breaking down and realising that I really had to do something about this, that I remember being scared of my dad and I didn't want my children to grow up feeling that way about me. You know, we're meant to be their rock. <laughs> yeah. Then We're meant to be their safe place, as a, you know, especially as a mum. And um, so I started my own um, healing journey. And, you know, I saw some counsellors. I started seeing different types of um, alternative therapists and really started going on that deep journey and digging deep and, and, and healing all the stuff from my past and breaking the cycle. You know, So I, you feel like you've broken the cycle? I feel like I've broken the cycle. And even though my children may still have stuff they need to heal because of how I was, I know I've set an example for them and shown them that you can change, that you can work on yourself. Um, And, you know, I think now my my children are are in their late teens now and they recognise that and they even comment that, you know, they've even told me they're proud of me and they're proud of what I do now and, you know, they've acknowledged the changes that they've seen and... um, And for so long I didn't want to spend the money working on myself because I thought it was selfish... And, 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 was and I it did hard? think that's just the way it is. I'm just going to be like my dad. That's just the way it is. Was it hard? I think no, it was. It, when I finally made that decision, it wasn't hard because it was about my children. Yeah. I had that why and about Luke. Mm. Like, I, 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 you know, I think I don't know how much longer Luke would have stood by me if I hadn't done the work on myself because, you know, I didn't always treat him the way he deserved to be treated. But it wasn't because he was doing anything wrong. It was it was my stuff that needed looking at. You know, he's, something he did may have triggered me, but I was triggered because of, you know, trauma or shame that I held around myself. Not feeling good enough was a massive trigger for me. And we often, when we're in the thick of it, find it easy to blame external yeah. I did for a long time have a lot of anger towards my parents um and I guess did blame them but you know working on myself I've healed that and I love them for who they are and I know that they did the best they could on based on what they knew and the way they were brought up that everyone's dealing with their own past and their own experiences that influence the way they respond to the world Absolutely. And Luke, you've had your own journey as well, haven't you? Mm, So Kim's been talking about the turmoil that she's gone through and I know that she now um, provides a coaching service. I think yours is mainly for women or... um, Yeah, look, I work with women. I do work with some men and families. I love working with families as well. So it's absolutely wonderful that you've grown together, personally yeah. developed together, and um, and you both provide coaching, don't you? So yeah. um, if my memory serves me correctly, your business is Healthy Man's Cave. Healthy Mind Man Cave. Healthy Mind Man Cave. So um, so how did all that begin for you and, and, and what does that look like in uh, respect to Kim's story? Were you going through your own stuff at the same time? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. So we, we didn't go through everything at the same time Kim started 
working on herself and then it was through all the grief and everything that I had that I actually decided or she told me that I need to do the work but so so for where it started for me was like when I was 16 was a prestigious all boys school um had a great upbringing you know with the family and everything but the thing was was um the the picking on and everything like that so the tall poppy syndrome in an all boys school and everything through there was really hard didn't realize you know the self-esteem wasn't there you'd you'd always be you know labeled out or anything like that so I came home when I was 16 and I got told my dad's got cancer so for me at that stage I didn't even know what cancer was um good family life dad was really fit he was a (coughs) excuse me so he was a um, free diver, so he could hold his breath for three minutes. So for me, I, he was my best mate. He was a what, sorry? Free diver. Oh, a diver. Yeah. Oh, so he was able to hold his breath for three yeah. minutes. So as far as you were concerned, mm. he, he, he was the epitome of health. Other than the fact that you got bullied at school, you yeah. felt like your family were your rock. They were, yeah. Mum and Dad, sort of, they did have a good relationship. We didn't talk about emotions much, but... Um, what happened from there was he ended up getting, you know, c- <clears throat> cancer in a bad way. So he got stage four in his bone, had to watch him suffer and die in a horrible way, which was, you know, f- for a 16, 17-year-old boy going at 18 and then watching your dad die was, was horrific. I just didn't know how to deal with it. So for me, I was like using, um, you know, as a young man, alcohol, drugs, things like that to try and deal with it. But the problem was with my mum my brother took over the family business, they didn't actually deal with anything. They just said, you know, we just get along with things, which is massive. So not dealing with things, and it's a big trauma that we couldn't get on with it. We hadn't dealt with it. And so this manifested up. And my brother didn't know how to deal with being a boss and dealing with everything, with running a business, for me being a sparky. So then we, um, hang on, can I just grab a drink for a sec? Yeah, of course you can. So um, was that difficult for you to watch um, with Luke going through that, um, Kim? Well, I, I I met him quite a few years after his dad had passed, yep. but it was hard to witness seeing, um, I guess the hardest thing for me is when we met, I remember asking Luke, you know, why do you never talk about your dad? Mm. Like we'd moved in together and he didn't have a photo and I think that was when it was a big realisation to me that they had, they'd they never dealt with it. You just don't talk about it. Yeah. And I remember saying to him, you know, I want to hear about your dad. What was your dad like? Like, you know, I know you only had him for a short period of time and they had a super, super close relationship. Yeah, it was. And I remember saying to Luke, Luke describes it as a caramel slap to the face. <laughs> yeah, that day. That yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? What does it mean? Well, so for me, it's like, because I dealt with grief of my, my, then my brother dying, then my mum dying of brain tumours, I end up with undiagnosed depression. I'm sorry, who died? My, 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 my brother died. Oh, so your brother died as yep. well? She wants to know what's a caramel slap So means. what a caramel slap is, is something where it's like, you know, the wake up, you know, you need to do this, but it's with a loving hand. Ah, oh, so right. then it's I've like, never heard that before. Yeah. Have you heard that before, Paul? No. No. No, no okay. I'm learning all these new things <laughs> this morning. Yeah, so that was the wake up that I needed, you know. And, and, the, and, bef- and that the caramel slap was like, unless you do something about this, I can't see us having a future together. Because it and was impacting all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and you'd already started your journey I, by that I, I, stage. I, yeah. And I let, I let Luke go for a period of time because I think grief has – it's different for everyone. Cause what, so when his mum passed away, I was very aware because of the work that I had done that the grief that was coming up for Luke was not just about his mum – it was the unresolved grief about his brother. It was the unresolved grief that he'd never dealt with about his dad. And I let him go through his processing of it for, it was probably around 12 months. And he became quite distant from me, from the kids. And it got to the stage where I just had to pull him aside and like say, yeah, you need to you need to address this. I don't care how you do it, what, but you need to find a way that resonates with you and do some work on healing this because otherwise I don't know how we're going to journey together as a couple. So that was a caramel slap. That was a caramel slap. <laughs> and you've um, clearly moved on because you're actually coaching other men now. So what is the um, 
if somebody were listening that can relate to what you've been through, what what would what would you say to them? Um, that uh, for me, it's like this: your own story is part of your life. You don't need to let that be your your whole life. You know, you can you can move on from that. That's for me. I found that when I do tell my story to people, that don't feel sorry for me because where my life is now is not part of my story from where it was. Yeah, it's really hard when you're in that hole though. Like it's always um, so much easier, I believe, to look back as the people we are now. But when you're actually going through that, would you both agree that if you look back at the human going through each of those experiences, it's really a different version of yourselves? Absolutely. It's totally a different version of yourself. And, you know, sometimes we have to hit rock bottom before we... Sometimes or always, do you think? Because there's always a turning point, isn't there? I think sometimes. A lot of people need to hit rock bottom before they make that decision that they want to... Because your turning point was your children children. looking looking at you and you feeling like you had failed them. And your turning point was your wife... Yeah. saying enough's enough. And I think a lot of guys are similar that their wife generally does the work first before they step up and do the work on themselves because they sort of get left, they feel like they, they're going to get left behind in the, in the relationship. It's really older. interesting to hear a man say that. I've heard a lot of um, women say that. So why do you think that that is? I think a lot of it comes down to the connection with the children because they don't want to pass that on to their, their children. They want them, you know... Women, uh, it's not so much of an ego, I don't think, in it. For guys, you know, we feel like we're okay, but we we tend to go down that pathway that, you know, we just keep going because that's the way we do things and, you know, we just keep ourselves busy in work or, or something like that, trying to be the provider. But I don't think we, we're generally good at looking inside ourselves. And I, I find a lot of guys that I do with, and this took me a long time, is there's our own self-love. Um, a lot of guys don't feel like, and that was the part of the story about when I was at school, um, getting knocked down at an early age. And the big thing was, you know, pointing the finger at someone and saying, oh, you love yourself, you're full of yourself. But that was a point for myself that I realised where it was was so important, but my own self-love. But yeah, it took me a long time to get to that point, to realise that I needed to work on myself. But yeah, it was the nudge, the caramel slap. Would it be true to say also that in a traditional family relationship, and I know that, you know, they're not as common as what they were, but in a traditional family relationship, you have a mother and a father. And in a lot of cases, the mentoring and the role modelling for the daughter from the mother has been a lot stronger. So I feel like the boys have been on the back step. I don't feel like in a lot of cases they've had as strong as mentoring and role modelling from the father for a lot of different reasons, uh, possibly because the father has been the breadwinner and outworking and physically absent, in a lot of cases possibly emotionally absent because that's the way that he was brought up. Uh, so would would they be v- genuine reasons, do you both think, for the, the, why men are catching up, as you kind of said there, Luke? Um, yeah, I think, um, God, well, I think guys have realised that. I, I think it's more the women are sort of pulling the guys along a bit more, um, that they're doing more work, you know, and they're realising that they need to do that to be able to, you know, keep a relationship together and that's what I felt like um it all, all depends on every different story and every different household mm. I think for, for a lot of guys do you have any theories yeah Kim? I think it's a societal influence that you know for a long time men have been expected to be very much in that masculine energy and macho and we've got to be strong and tough and it's mm. not um it's a weakness to show that you're vulnerable and um, that there are a lot of um, men out there that have become disconnected from their emotions because of that. You know, not intentionally, just it's just unconsciously occurred for them that they've become very disconnected. And, you know, um, I think 
more so for men than women, they will just push it down and get on with it because they are seen as the breadwinner and they have to provide. And, you know, there's men want to feel like they're there to support their, their family and um, be strong for the whole family. And yet, un- indirectly, them not dealing with their stuff can be letting their family down. I think we're now seeing that young men and men tapping into their vulnerability is actually a real strength. Yeah, it's. Um, I think a lot of men would be really surprised to learn that women find that very sexy yep. when a man has emotional intelligence yep. uh, rather than running from it and actually stepping up into it. Uh, but from my perspective, from what I can see, I think a lot of men don't know how to do that. They don't know what that looks like. You're doing a lot of nodding over there, Paul. Did you want to add anything to this conversation? Well, I was thinking I should be taking notes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just uh, well, actually happy it's recorded. Um, I, uh, maybe just one one thing. I totally understand what you guys are saying, but I re- I've, it just it's made me realise... I grew up fatherless, yep. grew up with a mother, so I grew up very emotionally connected growing up with a mother, but yet n- not growing up with a father. I see a lot of good friends of mine who grew up with that strict father who were never in touch with any any emotional sides, you know, or being able to show emotion um, or express um, things that they actually really want to express. It's... It's the same cultural thing. It's we just get on with it. We don't talk about it. Mm. We just get on with it. Whereas, it's like you grow up with a mum, you're, you're quite happy expressing, talking, and um, yeah, it's very true. No, it's it's, it's great listening. So you've uh, so so you've actually seen that as a mm. positive in your life, having a mother influence, uh, having such a strong mother influence. Have you ever felt like you've missed out from having that role modelling now that you are a father? Has that been has that been difficult in any way? No, because I remember, and I've often discussed this with with my mom and my wife, that I can clearly clearly always remember I was twelve, and looking at friends of mine who had that father figure in their lives, and that really inspired me to have the hope that one day I would be a great father, not only a great father, I'll be an exceptional father to my kids when I do have kids. And that that um, went with me uh, for, for years. And having the opportunity to have three beautiful kids, my wife will tell you, I, I'm exceptional. Maybe not when it comes to the disciplinary side of things. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, and that's stuff that I need to work on. Um, I'm not really good at disciplining um, just because... My kids are everything to me, and being that father that I've always wanted to be, it's like I want to do everything now that I've always dreamt of. Isn't it interesting? Like um, when the kids, the kids know, don't they? They know who to go to to ask. They know who's in charge, don't they? Like if they want to sleep over, as an example, who do they go to, Paul? <laughs> um, I want, my kids are very young, but absolutely, when it's TV, yeah, they'll come and say, "Hey, you know," because they come, you know. Uh, funny enough, my kids call me honey. <laughs> they call you honey. Uh, so Liam, the, the eldest boy growing up, all he heard was my wife saying, honey, honey, can you do this, honey? Ah, so, he, so he thinks that's inst- your name. Instead of dad or instead of <laughs> papa, it was honey. That's so gorgeous. The first word to me was honey. So all the kids yeah. call, me, call, call me honey. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I just share, I think that's a really beautiful example that Paul's showing here that despite him growing up without a father – that we we are in power we have the power to con- empower our lives and choose who we choose to be and there would be um, women and men out there that grew up in a that sort of scenario that you know men that have, may have not become good dads and and sit there in resentment in the fact that they didn't have a father and that's why it is because you know you mentioned what my I'm mm. not okay about that. Yeah. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Mm. Whereas Paul is a classic example, a, a really fine example of where he he decided to be empowered and make that choice mm. that despite not having that 
um, role model in his life that he was going to do things differently and that he was going to be the best father he could possibly be. When you spoke about the 75,000 intergenerationally, yep. so is that on a soul level? No, or it's is not that intergenerationally. It's just in society. So okay. when, when a person works on themselves, and I don't like to use the word becoming better because we're not broken. We're just... Really, when we do the inner healing, we're becoming who we truly, truly are inside. Yeah. Um, you know, when, I'm, when I've done the work on myself and I'm living my life in a place where I'm happy, we treat people differently. So, you know, you're going to smile at people at the shops. You're going to, you know, my children are going to respond differently because their mother's in a better place. And it ripples out. And, you know, if I've smiled at someone at the shop and made their day, it's lifted their mood. And then they've gone and interacted differently because their mood's risen. So it just ripples out. Okay. Yeah. Understand now. Yeah. Yeah, the 75,000. 75,000. Yeah, that is phenomenal. I'm not sure how they work worked it out but yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) but yeah it stands to reason um and it's really the power of multiplication isn't it like if you look at it like that yeah so um with that let's go to a song and then when we come back we'll um find out more about what is not okay in uh Paul Harmon's world or um what he's doing more so to help And we're back. Thank you for joining us on Sunday Morning Business Plus with Lisa. And I'm joined this morning by uh, three guests, but I'm going to be speaking to Paul Harmon. Paul's business is Handy Ute. And Paul and I met through a business group for like-minded people. And I have just been so inspired by his story. I have actually spoken to Paul previously in an interview inside our group, uh, just so, so inspiring. And when I asked him and invited him to come on to IPL Radio this morning, which is based all around mental health, I said to him, Paul, what is not okay with you? Because for so many of us, there's so many things that are not okay. But he succinctly said, people coming together or, or, or maybe it should read people not coming together and standing up for one another. We need to take care of one another. Now, before I ask you to explain what you mean by that, let's maybe just have a little bit of a look together of how Handy Ute started. So maybe start by just letting everybody know about your business. What is Handy Ute and what does it provide? Handy Ute is um, basically a pickup and delivery service and we provide a service that anybody can call and say, hey, I, I've just found a chair on Marketplace that I would like to get picked up and delivered um, on this date or ASAP and that's the service that we, we provide, especially for people who go shopping to Ikea and the normal thing you go shopping for one little thing and all of a sudden you've got <laughs> you've got <laughs> wardrobes and bed frames and you realize well I can't I can't get it um yep. home so our service comes in where they can call they can get a service ASAP within the hour uh, you'd go within an hour within wow hour, yes. what a fantastic service yeah so marketplace um is fantastic um people purchasing a lot of people are buying online um and it's getting bigger and bigger so to have that delivery service, and that's how it, you know it's it's handy to have somebody with a Ute. So handy Ute. And I love the story behind your business. When did you start? Started very beginning of January. I was in a situation where um, my workplace uh, was going to become compulsory to be mandated or vaccinated. To, to be vaccinated, vaccinated against COVID. Yeah. Yes, and. I personally did not want to be vaccinated, but it was a conversation that was lingering around for probably about six months prior to that, and a lot of us said that we didn't want to, um, we chose not to, but then a lot of pressure came until the point where uh, my boss said, look, become, come January, everybody needs to be vaccinated to continue working in the workplace, and 
I really questioned that. And I asked him just before the Christmas break to please consider speaking to his legal team um, about it. And that I, I wanted him to have a broader understanding of what was really going on. So took the Christmas break and the reality was that all around me people were getting let go. People who chose not to be vaccinated. And I found that very, very disturbing doctors, nurses, people that we knew, people in the police, um, really good people, in, in, in qualified for many, many years, were getting let go of the workplace. Was that over, over, that must have caused a lot of anxiety in your life because you've got young children, don't you, Paul? Yes, that's right. I think what the hardest part was, my friendships in the workforce started um, creating this segregation because they started getting vaccinated. And then I started getting looked at at well, why should he be allowed to continue in the workplace not vaccinated when we've done the right thing and went and got vaccinated? So that's when a lot of se- segregation had started. And that's traumatic. plays on your mental health. It, it, you go home, you've got a family, um, you know, you've got a wife and kids to take care of. And I came to the point where it was really possible that after Christmas, going back, I was told that that's it, you've you're no longer needed in the workplace. So um, my wife and I are Christians and I spent <laughs> quite a, um intense week or so and um, just prayed about it and I said, okay, this is this is definitely possible. W- what is it I do? W- w- what am I going to do? And I just really felt um, God saying to me, got a youth out the front of your house, use it. So I spoke to the wife. We've got a youth, let's use it. What do we do? And that's how Handy Youth evolved. Um, two weeks later I went back to the workplace and my boss said to me I've chosen not to comply continue in your workforce and that really blew my mind away um, but the first two weeks of handy you the phone wouldn't stop ringing so we just done a little Facebook page put it out there um, put it on a few different pages and within two weeks the, the phone just kept on ringing kept on ringing and I was in my workplace and couldn't answer the phone in the workplace, but Thomas finished work was getting all these miss miss calls and messages, um, and I was hearing more and more stories of people really, really suffering because they're not at work anymore. Um, they were being let go, and that really impacted me. And I love history, love history, and I was really thinking about what on earth is going on in the world at the moment. This it's it's really bad. And, you know, I came to a point that I realized um, there's a very good question the Soviets asked when they liberated in the Auschwitz. And they seen the absolute mess that was before their eyes. And what they did was they went on the opposite side of the wall to everybody who was living a normal life. And they brought them all in. And they stood them all up. And they made them have a good look at what actually took place. And the question they asked them was, why didn't you not do something about it? Why did you turn a blind eye? And that to me was so impacting that that's the way I felt at that moment of time. And I was like, okay, what is it am I going to do? Am I going to turn a blind eye? Or am I going to acknowledge what's actually in front of my eyes with these mandates? So I decided to do something about it. And I, we, we put out an advertisement. And I think within um, 12 hours, we had so many people ring and saying, look, I've got a ute, I've got a van, what can I do? And um, cut a long story short, we took on as many people that got sacked as possible. And... I really made it a purpose of <laughs> only finding people who got let go of the workplace. Yeah, because you wanted to look after people that, n- that 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 um, stood together. Yes, um, and, and stood up for what they believed in. Yes, and what ended up happening is that people started hearing about this. I didn't make any money from it. People would ring and say, "Well, how much it would it be?" And I'd say, "Just give the driver whatever you feel." And so what was happening? The, all these drivers were. Um, doing these do, doing this work, and and 
people were just paying them four times as much what they should have been paying just because wow. they knew the, the um, they knew the circumstances and they probably appreciated their courage yes no matter what um you know what they felt about the actual vaccine they probably admired their courage and wanted to help them as yes. from one human to another yep. and look uh, i'm a full full firm believer that if you choose to get vaccinated that is absolutely no problem in my eyes i choose not to but let's not have segregation yeah we're family we're friends um Let's let's be there for it's it's not good enough that people are losing their livelihood. Let's do something about it. What are we doing? And I got introduced to the pantry in WA, and I met Bev. And uh, the pantry is a is a food donation organization where people come to get help. And ha- how long has Bev been running that for? I, I'm actually not quite sure how long Bev has been running that for, but all I know is I was so impacted. When I went to view what was going on and I seen cars lined up blocks away and it really made me understand that Bev is doing this because she knows the impact of what's actually happened to people through this pandemic. And she's amazing. She's reached out. She's helping people. We don't know people's circumstances, (coughs) but all we see is that the cars are lining up for that support. And I'm now in a position um, to be able to financially support. And my question is, who else is going to support? Come on, let's let's support this woman. Let's support each other. Um, Handy you, you know, my, my, my business has 13 people um, working. And it, it's fantastic. And um, Evan, really, really good um, guy I've known for a long time. He's... he's taken over the general part of it now and uh, taking it under his wing. And um, Handy Youth is providing that service. And at the end of the day, when we get to the other side, when eventually one day we will look back and we will ask the question, what side of the wall were you on? Why didn't you not do something about it when you could have? And that's the question that I really want to be able to ask people. When the time comes, when this pandemic is over and the waters are still... What did you do about it? What did we do to help those who were desperately in need? Mental health issues are very real. This is impacting people in a drastic way. And if I can be a voice to say, hey, handy you, I'll take on as many people as possible. And that's what I did. I distributed work. So everybody had some kind of income. Mightn't have been much, but we did it. We're still doing it, and we will continue to do it. And our main role is to help as many people as possible. And we financially support Bev in the pantry and um, whatever else it is that we can do to continue helping people. When you spoke about whether you wanted to make a choice to stand up and do something or just ignore the situation, did you really feel that it was a choice or did you feel like it was a calling so strong that you couldn't possibly have taken any other decision um look i i'm i really spend time in prayer about this and when i made that decision and that choice to go with uh, what i felt god was leading on my heart with the youth and i really felt i got to go get as many people as possible and employ them get them some work and all these amazing doors started open um I had, you know, insurance people who came out of the blue. Item, and everything fitted in absolutely perfectly. No, they didn't earn great money. Um, but it was something. Something enough for everybody to, to continue on and get by. Um, so I, I've, yeah, I believe that God has directed um, my feet. God has directed my paths. He's brought the right people at the right time. We've helped the right people at the right time. And I'll continue... Um, to keep on going until um, the, the, the next stage or the next step or what's going to happen. So what would you like to see people do that are listening? What, you know, if somebody's there... Because I think often what happens with humans is that we hear something and we feel impacted at the time and then we get distracted and something else happens or we go out that night and then we wake up the next day and then we just forget about it. So if yeah. people were to take action, what, what would you... Um, su- what 
what what can people possibly do? Because a lot of people feel like the little bit that they may be able to do isn't going to make any difference. I mean, Kim was talking before about the ripple effect and how many thousands of people it does actually impact. Uh, have you got any words of advice there? Yeah, it's it's let's get together and let's help people. It's in 20 years, how exciting is it to think when you look back and say, that's what we did to help, to help people who are really struggling. These guys got sacked. These guys were out of work. They had kids, no income. Um, when you look back in history and you were able to say, we done something about it, it's, it's an amazing feeling. Um, and I want churches to rise up. I want people who don't even have faith to rise up. And I want people to be aware that even donating $5 helps. Okay, Even the smallest thing, you're talking about a smile on the street. Um, it's, it's, I remember a great phrase from the Gladiator movie. He said that what we do in this life goes for eternity. And I love that phrase. So it is what we do. When we become self-absorbed and don't think of anybody else, we become very isolated. But when you start moving upon impacting people's lives, as you said, it's a ripple effect. And everybody can do something. Everybody can choose. I'd love to think that people after this radio interview will start ringing Handy Ute. Um, because Handy Ute is providing much services for people, financially, support, help, um, the likes of yourselves, so people start calling news guys for some advice. So that's what I would love. I would love that it, the, the mental health reality is so real. I want people to acknowledge that it is real because I'm tired of hearing um, stories of people committing suicide over this. Kim and Luke, did you know about the story of Handy Ute? No, no, not until we'd um, found out we were on this morning that we actually looked it up and you know, and now we've found you know the story behind it and I think it's an amazing. Um, it gives people you know that contribution, um, you know, being able to support their families is massive, especially for a, for a man um, when they feel like they've failed. Mm. That in itself is 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 so hard. For a guy, if you felt like you've let your family down, it, and and being able to provide that for you know, just as you said, just a little bit of income is is a massive part of of that being itself in mental health. And it's waking up with a purpose, exactly. And that type of job also going out and helping other people as well. Yes. Yep. Yep. And it's um, hey, whoever's listening, let's do something about it. Mm. What about you, Kim? Had you heard I the story it, before? I had it, but I love the story behind it and I think it's just a beautiful example of how about community, mm. coming together, forming community and supporting each other in community, um, not being segregated by what's going on in the world and, and seeing each other as human beings. Yep. No matter what your choices are, everyone's still a human being. And um, that has feelings, that has needs, that, you know, wants to feel a value in the world, that wants to, um, you know, contribute to the world. And, um, yeah, I really love what you're doing, Paul. The one, the one major thing that really got me stirred up was when somebody turned around and said to me, if you keep going like this, you're going to get in trouble because of the regulations and the government, what they were saying and everything else. And I said, you know what? Good. Let me get in trouble. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep on fighting for people. Keep on trying to employ as many people as possible so we can provide. So I think sometimes people have to rise up and take a bold stand to say, you know what? I don't care what they say about me. I don't care what they're threatening me with. I'm going to stand up to make sure that people get taken care of. Thank you, Paul. With that, we're going to um, actually. What I'd like to do is just to um, play a little 
jingle for IPL Radio because it just seems so relevant. Uh, Tris Reddick, the founder of IPL Radio, actually started this all around mental health. And this is a ripple effect in action because none of us would be here today uh, if he didn't first take that first move to start this amazing radio station uh, that has impacted, I'm quite sure, tens of thousands of people already. Welcome back. You're on air with Business Plus with Lisa and I'm joined by my three guests today, Kim and Luke Herman and Paul Harmon from Handy Ute. And we've just been discussing what life looked like for Paul before he started his Handy Ute. Um, What I would love to chat with you about, Paul, is I asked you previously the first time you remember standing up for yourself, would you like to share with that, that with the listeners? Because a lot of people in their lifetime have never actually stood up for themselves and what you did was really a huge case of that. What was your earliest memory of doing that? Are you talking about prior to... Yeah, just grow, just in your whole lifetime, you, you, you have actually, um, when I asked you that previously, um, you actually spoke about an incident with your mum. Yes, that's right. Just um, about, but I was getting. I remember I was getting severely bullied by this guy on the street. He wouldn't leave me alone, <laughs> and he was a lot older, a lot taller than me. And um, I remember I was speaking to my mum about. It. I said, "This this guy just won't leave me alone." I eh? and um, my mum said, "Oh, I'll keep an eye out." And I had an older brother, and reality is he was never kind of there. He should have done something about it. But anyway, on the street, bully came along, harassing me, hitting me. And then all of a sudden, I see my mom pick this teenage boy up. And he, he, like, he was a big teenage boy, but she picked him up like that, and she basically gave him a few whacks. Mother Bear came out. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I and think Kim and I can relate to that. You know, and <laughs> if you ever, ever touch my son again you'll deal with me and I remember the kid running off crying and then I'm thinking what a superwoman you know <laughs> mom I can't believe you after doing that this is so far but I remember instantly she was like saying I could get in a lot of trouble for this you know I shouldn't have gone that far but she said look just remember when it's time to be protected you need to come and speak up about it you need to come and tell me when things are not going so good and and that was the result of me speaking taking that advice, saying to my mom, I'm speaking up now, things are not good. Okay, let's deal with it. Let's do something about it. Yeah, well, that's an amazing story. Um, And that comes back to reaching out when you do need help and not being so proud, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, that's right. I think there's a saying, isn't there, and it goes, pride comes before a fall. Is that the way it goes? You've not heard that before? I I have, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what about you, Kim and Luke? Do you um, remember any particular time that you've stood up for yourself that you want to share? I know it's a really, really difficult one. I think for me, it's more so speaking up for others. I've always, (laughs) my mouth will get me into trouble. Yeah. I I find I'm a big... um, a big part of my personality is justice and right and wrong. And when I see something happening, you know, even, you know, even when we've been travelling around the world and we've gone to countries and there's people pushing in, like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. And oh, often no. my kids will look, oh, shush, shush, <laughs> mum, shush, shush. <laughs> pushing it in line. Well, I'll be yeah. like, well, no, it's rude. Just yeah. have respect. Mm. You know, it's about yeah. having respect for others. Um, you know, I certainly, if I was to see something happening on public transport or out in the street, I'm the person that would st- not hesitate to step in to stand up for someone else. Um, it's kind of like the fact that I could put myself in danger by doing that just kind of disappears. Yeah. Um, standing up for myself has probably evolved over time, as in... But then I've always I've always been quite an independent person anyway. So I guess you know, I think for me, standing up to my dad when he was speaking to me rudely as a teen, I was just like I'm not gonna allow you to speak to me that way and that's when I moved out of home. So that's huge. Yeah. I was just seventeen and a half and I was just like, No, I you might be my dad, but you don't speak to me that way. I'm not 
it's interesting how much courage it takes to stand up to people that are closest to us often. What about you, Luke? Um, I just think it's like, for me, it's like learning self-boundaries and um, boundaries for other people. So that's something I've had to learn over time about, you know, being able to put that into place because I, I was always a quiet guy, but, you know, quietly confident as well. But, you know, learning to speak up is something that I think you can never be too late to learn. And I also heard this great um, phrase was like, a true leader is not depicted on how often he draws his sword, it's about when he chooses not to. Mm. So sometimes it's best not to say something, but at the right moment. So it's all about timing for me. So I might let something slide, but then be that moment where this needs to be said, and that's when I'll choose to say it. Yeah, quite, um, quietly confident. Uh, Paul, when I asked you what your life looked like pre-COVID, you said it looked like Groundhog Day. What did you mean by that? Same thing every day. <laughs> Go to work. So background is mining. And um, yeah, it's same routine. Same routine. It's great. It's a great paying job. The mining industry pays a lot of money. It's tough. You're away. You're away from home. Um, kids miss out. Your wife misses out. And um, and th- that's what it felt like. It felt like Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. And uh, when I asked you what your life looked like now, I guess you could only call this a COVID blessing. You said that it was challenging, meaningful and has purpose. Yes. And you know what? What an, an amazing adventure. It's purposeful. That's what it is. It gives you meaning. It, it, it helps you... Um, it's like from all my biblical reading and studying, all of a sudden it's coming to life. You know, when I when I think of the stories of um, Jesus saying, "Give your friend a tunic, feed the poor, take care of the orphans, the widows, take care," and all of a sudden, you know, sometimes you just read it, mm-hmm. you overread it, mm-hmm. but then when you're put in a situation to say, "I can do something about this," and hey. There it is. It's 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 what I've been studying, and what an opportunity to get out, get your hands dirty, and do something about it. And it's so rewarding, and I'm so happy it happened. So the Paul today is a very different Paul from twelve months ago. Yes, and um, especially from my. And you know what? I I fully believe that because of this, um, the adventure of it, mo- the relationship with my wife and I, has blossomed. More and more because sometimes you go on the, this roller coaster of emotions, but when you're on a journey like this, it's pressed me more into getting on my hands and knees and saying, "God help me, I, I have no idea <laughs> what I'm going to do. What is the next step? God help me, give me the understanding, the decisions. Tell me it is what it is." And 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 when you can. Be so vulnerable to get on your knees and say, God, this is way bigger than me. Help me. And that's the roller coaster when you can trust God to lead you in the directions and lead the right people to you. It's so rewarding. And I'd never change it. Um, and it's it's so great. I can't, I can't put it into the words I want to probably put it into, but... Um, yeah, we, can I, he- we, uh, we can hear the emotion in your voice. It's exciting. It's exciting yeah. helping people. It's exciting seeing people's appreciation that somebody cares. You know, so many people I've spoken to in our community um, were very affected adversely by what they um, – because they felt all of the segregation and being segregated, but most of them would say that they feel like they're a better version of themselves mm. now. Um, and that it really helped them find their true purpose. And for many people, they wouldn't actually go back to the lives that they had previously. Um, what, Paul, has been the biggest impact for you mentally, socially, emotionally and physically um, through all of this, through the hardest times? Um, first of all, you're, 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 you're met with terror. And the reality of losing everything. And um, I think the, the reality of that confronting you, it scares the life out of you. 
Um, it makes you feel very small to the point where, as I said, I had to humble myself. When you're in the mining industry, you're making lots of money. You don't really have to worry about anything. Okay, Everything's sorted, bills are covered, everybody's happy. But then when you're hit with a crisis like this, is that, oh, hold on for a second, that's all about to go. Um, it makes you realize that you're very, very small. And having other inspirational stories to help me say, oh, actually, hold on, I'm not the only one going through this. And when you hear the likes of what Bev is doing, when you hear what, um, you know, Jim down the road has had, had a very well-paying job, but he's out cutting people's lawns for a living, whatever it is to get by, I thought to myself, wow, that's that's incredible. You know, so um, major impact mentally because... When you're bound by fear, it really clouds all judgments, right? And it gives you a, a sense of um, helplessness. Um, and it's only for, you know, you have good people. Like, like my wife is very encouraging. Come on, let's, let's get together. Let's pray. It's okay. Things are going to be okay. Hey, you know, I trust you that whatever it is or decisions that you're going to make, you're going to do for the best of our family. So I had the support. For me, it was fantastic. I had the support of my wife. That is so good. And unfortunately, a lot of people weren't in that same position. A lot of people's marriages actually um, came apart. They unthreaded. um, And then it's just so lovely to hear such a heartwarming story like Mm. yours to hear that it's done the opposite and brought you closer together. So. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Kim, when I asked you what your life looked like um, pre-COVID, you said, fortunately for me, very similar to now, but the main difference for you was that you're not doing the same travelling that you were doing. Yeah, we used to do a lot of travel. We enjoyed travelling. So for me personally, my personal life, I think it impacted Luke. It, you know, it did impact us, especially the electrical side of the business was impacted with, you know, work was affected with lockdowns and everything. But I was already working online and from home and um, the, the reality of having the kids at home for periods of time during lockdown was... Challenging. A bit challenging. <laughs> um, but it's still, I think the biggest impact it had on me was what I was witnessing outside of the home I mean we 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 were faced with that fear financially not to the extent of Paul but certainly it had impacted the business and you know what did that mean we were both self-employed too weren't you and and when you're self-employed yeah I mean look it doesn't matter whether you work for someone else if your livelihood is impacted financial stress is very very real Um, I think fortunately because we've done so much work on ourselves we, we had always made a decision that if we were ever in a situation financially, even if we lost everything, as long as we had our health in each other, that's all that really mattered. That, you know, it's not f- material stuff didn't define who we were in our lives. Um, so we were, you know, we made a conscious decision to try not to let that impact us. For me personally, the biggest impact was what I was witnessing outside of me, you know, witnessing families being torn apart, you know, with the segregation among people, people feeling alone, um, you know, people being treated because of their body autonomy and choices they were making but for themselves, you know, losing friends, friends not inviting them to things anymore. Um, I, I'm quite empathic and I, 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 I feel for people. And there was, you know, quite a significant period of time where I, I did mentally go into a low place because what I was witnessing, it was just, it was heartbreaking. It really did in many ways bring out both the worst and the best in humanity, Absolutely. didn't it? Absolutely. And and, and and fortunately, like what Paul said, that's, what, that's the power of fear. Mm. We become very unresourceful and very... Illogical when we are consumed by fear. And it's July 2020, 2022 now and in some ways it feels like it. the worst of it was such a long time ago but it really wasn't. 
it was very, very recent. It, yeah, yeah. But like you said, it feels sometimes like a lifetime ago. Yeah, because it was so real. But the, but the segregation and the, and I'm going to use the word, sometimes hatred towards people, it's still happening. It's still happening out there. There's a lot of fear out there, isn't there? Yeah, there's a lot of fear. And, and yeah, like I said, you, we can't, we, we become illogical when we're consumed by fear. Yeah, and being turned away from places are uh, a very, um, <laughs> a very, very strange feeling. <laughs> Certainly one that I wasn't used to. And I think from a mindset perspective too, it what we have gone through, the fear it's created has triggered a lot of trauma responses in people that they're actually operating and reacting from a place of past trauma and even even past generation because we we know by science that trauma can be passed down through generations um you know that that it's triggering that response that trauma response within people so have you found that um in the situation that we're in now that it's actually caused more clientele for you look there's certainly um I think the COVID situation certainly did bring up for people the reality of things that needed to be looked at in their lives and healing. It really, I think in a way that was a blessing, especially when we were in lockdowns and people were forced in homes. I mean, yes, it caught, it brought up trauma, but it, it, it forced people into a situation to be in a space and have time to look at themselves. So there certainly has been more people. <laughs> themselves or Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> true. <laughs> or ne- true. Um, there has certainly been more people that are, are finding themselves on that journey of, of, of healing. So yeah. definitely, yes. And I, and I know that there's more to come. There's still a lot of the situations that we've been through is still going to create ongoing issues for, I think, a long, long time. And what about you, Luke? What has the effect been on you emotionally, socially, physically? Um, so predominantly um, my business is electrical, you know, even though I work with men in mindset. Um, yeah, it was quite big on the, on the electrical sort of thing because I do work for myself. So when the lockdowns are on, if you're, not, if you're not working, you're not earning money. And, you know, it's quite a bizarre feeling that you're told you can't go outside and things like that. And for me, I'm a very active person like to surf and and do all those kind of things so being able to being told you can't do that it's um i find it's it's quite suffocating as a person um even when you you know you have a good mindset it's still you know quite a hard thing to deal with you know you can't go outside and i can imagine like being in the uk or something when they had lockdowns in small apartments I, I, i couldn't couldn't bear to think about how hard that would have been for people so so on that mental note it's really you know, it's a it's a tough place. So, and I also think like, you know, the other thing is I don't think people have spent so much time together as a family or with your partner as they've ever had in the past. And that in itself can put, you know, all these little niggly things, that, you know, you find you just let slide with your partner, all of a sudden become major things. <laughs> and, you, and you can't just go, oh, I'm just going to go for a walk around the block. You can't do that because you're not allowed to go anywhere. So I found, um, yeah, that. But, yeah, I found there was a, bit, a lot more interest in it. And I, you know, and also being a, an electrician working in people's properties, and you know, I could also speak to people about, you know, how are you going? How's your mindset? You know, what's, you, you guys okay? And they're the big questions. And then also being able to offer them a solution, you know, about have you tried this or this? So being able to, you know, give people some solutions when you're stuck in the problem. Because when you're in the problem, you end up just looking at the problem. You're not looking at the solution. So on that stage, it's really good to be able to just help people in, in little things, you know, just to be able to make them feel, you know, good about this situation or where they're at or directions and, and things like that. Did you want to um, let the listeners know what it is that Healthy healthy Man Mind Cave? Healthy, did I get yeah, it Healthy right? Mind Man Cave, yeah. yeah. So what what I do is I work one on one on Zoom um, with um, mainly guys. I do have uh, women as clientele, which is which is great. You know, some women find working with men is a lot better, and so we just take them through in an eight eight part process, an hour long each session, and then um, a lot of education is a big thing because you got to change your environment before you start working on yourself. And then we just can work out what we need to do. So we're very much a solution-based program. We, d- we don't dive into problems. 
So we're looking at where you want to be, not where you're at. So, and that in itself is a really good thing. So both you and Kim operate both separately and together. Yeah. 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 Okay. So what you know, one of the reasons that I love referring people to you, Luke, is that you're not the typical type coach because you are that you know you come across as that rough and tough um, type tradie. Yep. And I think a lot of men would relate to mm. that. Um, do you find that it's mainly other tradespeople that are, are needing your help? Like you probably, I couldn't imagine um, blue collar workers being your main clientele, or is that? I get all, all sorts of people. Um, you've just got to be able to, you know, get a connection with someone that, you know, and I always say when I first have a conversation with someone, it's like, you've got to be feel comfortable working with me because that's the most important thing. Otherwise, I'll refer you to someone else or, you know, because that's exactly where you need to be because you don't want to spend time with someone that you don't feel confident in. So I find, you know, from army, um, trades, uh, blue collar workers, all different sort of walks of life. You 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 find you know, but you need that connection. And I love that because that takes the ego away from it, which can often be a really mm. um a, a really big thing. We're going to go to another song, and then when we come back, um, Kim from um Kim Herman Coaching. I did say that correctly, didn't I, Kim? <laughs> and uh, Paul from Handy Ute. Uh, have a special offer for anyone that is listening uh, and then we'll just go to a song and we're actually going to play um, Kim's favourite song, something just like this, Chain Smokers. And we just listened to something just like this, the Chain Smokers Coldplay, and that was for one of my guests, Kim, today. And then that final one is the end of the world as we know it. And it's got in brackets and I feel fine. <laughs> and that was Paul from Handy Ute's song. So let's wrap it up because it has come to the hour, Business Plus with Lisa. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I will be back with more guests next week. But just to wrap up, uh, Paul, I believe that you have a special offer for anybody listening today. That's right. Um, the C-Class Restaurant of Perth, dinner for two. For people in Perth? Yes. Because it's, a, it's <laughs> a, and the next part of getting it, you have to be in Perth anyway. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and that's about going on and booking a job um, on our Facebook page and um, quoting um, IPL. IPL. Okay, fantastic. So um, just to step it down, very bas- basic steps. Somebody goes onto the Facebook page and they find Handy Ute. That's correct. They go and like your page. That's correct. And then they uh, book a job through you. So there's a little um, book a job tab there, I'm guessing. Yes, there is. Yep. And where do they put IPL Radio? Um, when they type in, it's the same thing if you send a, a Facebook message. Yeah. Uh, you'd be saying You'd be sending a message to the Handy Ute page and just leave a hash. hash okay, hash. brilliant. And when you do that, if you can please um, let Paul know, let Handy Ute know that you have also gone onto the IPL Facebook page and liked that um, as part of the competition. And how long have people got to do that? Uh, I, probably a fortnight. A fortnight, okay. So this competition will be running from... Today, the 24th of July, and we'll finish on the 7th of August at midnight. Okay, you better take a note of that. 7th of August. (laughs) It is official, 7th of August, midnight. This competition (laughs) will finish, but that's not to say you won't won't want to use the amazing services. Uh, So, Paul, thank you so much for joining me here today. Uh, I know that we have received so much value, and um, on behalf of humanity... Thank you for standing up and doing what you're doing with Handy Ute. Uh, I just love having guests on that have the potential to not only change one person's life, but to you know change the trajectory of other of everyone's life. And I really believe uh, that what you've done is doing that. So thank you. Um, and Kim and Luke, thank you so much. I've known you um, both for a number of years now, and we keep weaving back in, yeah. you know, back and forth into one another's lives. And most recently, we're in the same business group, and I really appreciate both of your friendships and 
you both as a business colleagues. Um, Kim and I uh, had um, quite a bit of time together. I think it was probably about a year ago and we had a vision board workshop that we had um, organised to put together and we had some amazing fun times doing that and it's still to be delivered but that's okay because uh, we've got it all ready to go. go, Yeah it's all ready to go (laughs) and that was such a lovely opportunity. So uh, Kim I'd love for you to share um, because I believe you have a special offer for listeners today as well. Yes so you know any listeners that you know are are interested in speaking to myself or Luke about the coaching work we do um, we're offering 10% off any of our services whether it be a program whether it be any of our you know single sessions group programs programs um, and we offer you know free um, soul I call it a soul chat if, you know if even if you want to just you know have a soul chat with us to tell us where you're at and and ask how is it I can actually help you because everyone's different and a lot of the work we do is very bespoke it depends on your specific circumstances and um, you know it's designed around helping you as an individual wonderful so they just need to let us know when they contact us that it was through IPL radio that they heard about us and they can they will get we will honor that now this um interview will be loaded onto the IPL YouTube channel so if they're watching this um later on down the track it doesn't matter Okay, fantastic. Thank, well, th- thank you on behalf of everyone. And the fact that they can do uh, what I would normally call a little discovery chat, but you call it a soul chat, they can do that for absolutely nothing. They just reach out and they can connect. So absolutely. nobody need um, struggle. You can speak to one of these beautiful humans here. Um, Luke, did you want to add anything before we close? Uh, no, I think it's been really good. Um, been some great stories and finding out different different things that people do um i think this this station's been really good in offering that that for that that mental health it's um it's it's a big part of what is needed in the community in the last couple of years it's really come to a a big forefront for me um understanding you know what i do is more important than just myself and i feel like you know myself and my wife being able to offer that for for couples and things like that to and for me, I, I just feel like it's, you know, it's been really good. I really enjoyed it. But, yeah, thanks so much for having us on today. Yeah, very um, grateful to you, Lisa, for inviting us on the show. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you to all of you. So we're going to close and I look forward to seeing you um, join us or, or know that you'll be joining <laughs> us back on IPL Radio uh, next Sunday. Actually, next Sunday the timing's going to be a little bit different. I'm normally on at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning and I'm just looking at the boss sitting over on the other side of the room, but I believe it's midday next week. Yeah, midday. Uh, and the reason for that is because IPL Radio are actually going to be broadcasting live. Um, and for me to do the interviews, I really need to be able to be in the studio. So uh, midday next Sunday with three other amazing guests. Thank you.